Um, so this afternoon, uh, I'm just very briefly going to talk to you about future directions of micro sampling, uh, just to give you some, some of an idea of some of the sorry, an idea of some of the thoughts that are going around the literature. Uh, when I'm reading the the what's around, I'm often overwhelmed by the ideas that are being put forward, usually because I of the idea of their clinical applicability, and so uh, I. But what I find is that sometimes it's too easy to dismiss the ideas of, uh, that, are, that are coming towards, you know, that people are putting forward. And, uh, and um, perhaps, I, I think perhaps where I can, I limit myself by my own capacity to believe when I see a new idea. And I'll give you an example of one of those this afternoon. Um, so I'll take you through some other types of micro samples that people are putting forward and uh, give you an, uh, that haven't been covered today, and also discuss what I th you know the next ten years might look like with some of the um, ideas from some of the thought leaders in micro sampling from around the world. Um, so some researchers are st uh, still considering uh, dry blood spots uh, and trying to work through the issue of variability in hematocrit. Um, Meringering have come up with a new dry blood spot card and uh, they, uh, they published uh, suggesting it has, it's independent of hematocrit <coughs> values of blood. This new card, it's a hydrophilic coated woven polyester fibre. Sounds very flash. Um, you can see from the pictures at the top the, of the distribution of blood as they apply it and you can see the way it spreads. And it, it, so one of the issues when you have a dry blood spot is uh, as you apply it, they, they see two different types of effects. One is that you can see uh, where the concentration becomes higher around the outside, so you have to be careful not to sample or sub-sample around that area. Um, and they also see the complete opposite, where sometimes you find your analyte is concentrated in the centre and dilute around the outside. So they're trying to come up with ways to avoid this sort of thing. And so you can see they're trying this new fibre. Um, the, well, the advantage of dry blood spots is it's cheap and really um, easy to come by. And I think that's why people really want to hang on to the idea and not let it go too soon. And I think that's really important. Um, so what they found was the homogeneity across this spot, this new type of fibre, um, was 5% across a hematocrit range of 20 to 70%. So it looks like it's, um, it's, you know, it's still a feasible idea. Uh, Yukonovsky have got an idea of a pre-cut dried blood spot and this can um, overcome some of the impacts of hematocrit by sampling the entire spot and if you've got a, a, a what they call a volcano effect where you've got different concentrations across your spot this can avoid it by simply taking the whole spot. This reminds me a little bit of when I came out of university and I worked on a, a, someone was trying to design a titration system and it was being held together with gaffer tape and paper clips. Um, you'll see that what they've got here is they've got their, um, their dry blood spots and they've stuck it to some adhesive tape and then they're applying their blood from that. But it's a start and we'll see how it works. Um, certainly across a hematocrit range of 25 to 75%, they saw a precision of 3%. So there's certainly something in the idea. The, this uh, is something we've looked at many times, solid phase micro extraction. The idea is that you take a pre-coated biocompatible fibre and you insert it through the tissue into the blood vessel and it equilibrates with your blood sample and when you remove the fibre, you're collecting free levels. And you've probably heard from me a bit that we're really after unbound concentrations. So this is a way of achieving that. One of the advantages, there's no blood draw. All you're collecting is, all you're removing is a small amount of drug. So that could be, you know, it's got, it's got potential of, of an idea of measuring unbound levels. One of my difficulties with it, and when I see this, is it looks quite invasive. In fact, it looks remarkably like what they describe as quite like a hypodermic needle. And I'm not quite sure that you could convince a paediatric patient that it's any different to a needle. But Frisson uh, have uh, done a an ex vivo study on this with human plasma. They actually used 200 um, 
microliters of plasma and they spiked that with midazolam. But they had a good linear range using the technique and precision with 7%. The reason, one of the reasons they're looking at this is solid phase microextraction is used a lot um, in um, sort of wastewater analysis, that sort, of er that sort of area. But before I dismiss this idea, Ms. Dieter came up with this study, which is where they use um, SPME um, for a pharmacokinetic study in rats, and what they did was they placed this SPME holder in the carotid artery, and I'm not suggesting we do that in, in any humans, but they placed it in the carotid ar artery of a rat, and um, then from that they placed the SPME device into the holder, it stays for two minutes, then they withdraw it, and that's a way for analysis. So the thing that's going in and out is this SPME fibre. Meanwhile, the holder stays in place, and what I started to think was, how would that go in an indwelling cannula? And then have you got something that you can use in humans? Um, so in this study, they quantified diazepam. Um, the internal standard was coated on the fibre, and they found a good correlation between the results in whole blood to those in plasma. And their concentration time, pro time profiles were um, in good agreement with the literature values. Um, Steve mentioned Bioanalysis Zone. So this is a, um, a website uh, run by the Future Science Group, who are the publishers of the Bioanalysis Journal. The Bioanalysis Journal has really been um, supporting microsampling and encouraging new ideas and studies in microsampling. In January this year, they had a panel discussion uh, with some of the leading innovators and experts in microsampling. It's well worth watching. But some of the ideas they discussed was that um, rather than there being a big surge in the implementation of microsampling, it's more likely to be driven by case-by-case -case evidence which will build and push microsampling into normal clinical development. They felt that the types of studies that will bring microsampling forward will be where there's actually no other option but to microsample. So home-based sampling, sampling in third world countries, therapeutic drug monitoring, but then also new compounds. And that as new compounds come through the pipeline, if, they, if we start measuring them in a microsample, as they move through everything, we, all our data, we continue to relate back to a microsample. Uh, one of the other ideas they discussed is that microsampling may assist the emergence of personalised medicine, where people are in charge of their own health and engaged in their own treatment. One of the ideas is that you collect a sim single sample yourself at home and you send it away and for genomics or phenomics testing. And they liken this to the same way we're now wearing Fitbits and heart rate monitors. And so it's just that engagement in our own health. Uh, they commented that we're naturally, a naturally conservative community. And so I think uh, maybe five to eight years ago, there felt like there was a groundswell and people were going to push forward with microsampling. Certainly, you know, there was a lot of work on dry blood spots back then. But what you see now is that it's really pulled away in the literature. It, um, Preclinical development, it's moving forward. And you can see the percentages of studies coming through now using microsampling are in the preclinical development area. Clinical research has really dropped away and part of that might be not understanding regulatory requirements because there isn't a lot of information out there, but also trying to work out how to adapt a study for microsampling when it's already, you know, when we're trying to compare, compare to plasma. Um, in, with our, um, our clinical bridging study, I, I was thinking to myself, you know, do you just have to keep collecting plasma samples and keep comparing to plasma? You know, is that going to be, even when you take it into, you know, so we start in adults, when I take it into kids, am I going to just have to keep doing that? But I think with our bridging studies, um, uh, to publish the data, you'd publish the plasma, you publish the micro sample, and then at least you've got a, a, you know, a, a ground level again, and then you can start, the, the literature can start to be comparing to this point. 
Uh, and they, one of the ideas is that, you know, with preclinical development being supported by regulatory agencies, um, I wonder if that's strategic and if the FDA um, can see that by starting at that early level that the, the impetus of including microsampling will come as they move through the pipeline. Um, they identified that with microsampling we might see some changes to current systems. So a mass spec in the pharmacy, bedside or remote. And part of this is about you know, what kind of mass spec will we be using. It probably won't be a triple quad because it's hard to fit in a suitcase. But you know, the QTOF might be coming down. That might be where the energy is spent in, um, in developing of mass specs. They also see the automation of analysis and barcoding of samples. Um, as you know, these will all be changes that we'll see coming through. Um, but my thoughts on the future of implementing microsampling, I think we need to work together and you know, it's, it's like the involvement of the, one, the people in this room. Um, we each bring our own perspective to the process and I think we can devise you know, scientifically rigorous work that can bring microsample into routine, the routine clinical environment. Um, if we were to view traditional sampling as obsolete, where large volume sampling is no longer acceptable, then maybe this would drive the impetus to bring microsampling you know, into our routine clinical practice. When I um, speak to my kids or other parents on this issue, they, uh, they want it to happen already. You know, when I describe what I'm doing, they're saying, you know, no, I don't want a blood test. <laughs> um, you know, can you just take a sample? And when they know that that's what we're working on, it's definitely you know, something they want to see is happening right now. Um, so as we, as um, despite our scientific, oops, sorry, community <laughs> being largely conservative, um, as we bring, you know, when we bring new compounds through the registration process, the innovators might not be thinking about microsampling on their way, but if we are, then we can introduce the idea as these new compounds come into, you know, into clinical practice. And um, so, it, you know, there might be a lot of work ahead of us trying to bring microsampling forward, but it'll be worth it. Thank <laughs> you.